Hello, good evening, and welcome to chapter 22 of Anne of Avonlea. This chapter is titled, Odds and Ends. So you had tea at the stone house with Lavender Lewis, said Marilla at the breakfast table next morning. What is she like now? It's over 15 years since I saw her last. It was one Sunday in Grafton Church. I suppose she has changed a great deal. Davy Keith, when you want something, you can't reach. Ask to have it passed and don't spread yourself over the table in that fashion. Did you ever see Paul Irving doing that when he was here to meals? But Paul's arms are longer than mine, brumbled Davy. They've had eleven years to grow and mine have only had seven. Besides, I did ask. But you and Anne were so busy talking, you didn't pay any attention. Besides, Paul's never been here any meal except tea. And it's easier to be polite at tea than at breakfast. You ain't half as hungry. It's an awful long while between supper and breakfast. Now, Anne, that spoonful ain't any bigger than it was last year. And I'm ever so much bigger. Of course, I don't know that Miss Lavender used to look like, but I don't fancy somehow that she has changed a great deal, said Anne, after she had helped Davy to maple syrup, giving him two spoonfuls to pacify him. Her hair is snow white, but her face is fresh, almost girlish, and she has the sweetest brown eyes, a, such a pretty shade of wood brown with little golden glints in them, and her voice makes you think of white satin and tinkling water and fairy bells all mixed up together. She was reckoned a great beauty when she was a girl, said Marilla. I never knew her very well, but I liked her as far as I did know her. Some folks thought her peculiar even then. Davy, if I ever can you at that trick again, you'll be made to wait for your meals till everyone else is done, like the French. Most conversations between Anne and Marilla in the presence of the twins were punctuated by these rebukes Davy word. In this instance, Davy, sad to relate, not being able to scoop up the last drops of his syrup with his spoon, had solved the difficulty by lifting his plate in both hands and applying his small pink tongue to it. Anne looked at him with such horrified eyes that the little sinner turned red and said, half shamefacedly, half defiantly, There ain't any waste of that way. People who are different from other people are always called peculiar, said Anne. And Miss Lavender is certainly different, though it's hard to say just where the difference comes in. Perhaps it is because she is one of those people who never grows old. One might as well grow old when all your generation do, said Marilla, rather reckless of her pronouns. If you don't, you don't fit in anywhere. Far as I can learn, Lavender Lewis has just dropped out of everything. She's lived in that out-of-the-way place until everybody has forgotten her. That stone house is one of the oldest on the island. Old Mr. Lewis built it eighty years ago when he came out from England. Davy, stop jiggling Dora's elbow. Oh, I saw you. You needn't try to look so innocent. What does that make you behave so this morning? Maybe I got out the wrong side of the bed this morning, suggested Davy. Uh, Milty Bolter says if you do that, things are bound to go wrong with you all day. His grandmother told him. But which is the right side? And what are you to do when your bed's against the wall? I want to know. I've always wondered what went wrong between Stephen Irving and Lavender Lewis, continued Marilla, ignoring Davy. They were certainly engaged twenty-five years ago, and then all at once it was broken off. I don't know what the trouble was, but it must have been something terrible, for he went away to the States and never come home since. Perhaps it was nothing very dreadful at all. 
I think the little things in life often make more trouble than the big things, said Anne, with one of those flashes of insight which experience could not have bettered. Marilla, uh, please don't say anything about my being at Miss Lavender's to Mrs. Lynde. She'd be sure to ask a hundred questions, and somehow I wouldn't like it. Nor Miss Lavender either, if she knew. I feel sure. I dare say Rachel would be curious, admitted Marilla, though she hasn't as much time as she used to have for looking after other people's affairs. She's tied home now on account of Thomas, and she's feeling pretty downhearted, for I think she's beginning to lose hope of his ever getting better. Rachel will be left pretty lonely if anything happens to him with all her children settled out west, except Eliza in town, and she doesn't like her husband. Marilla's pronouns slandered Eliza, who was very fond of her husband. Rachel says if he'd only brace up and exert his willpower, he'd get better. But what is the use of asking a jellyfish to sit up straight? Continued Marilla. Thomas Lynn never had any willpower to exert. His mother ruled him till he married, and then Rachel carried it on. It's a wonder he dared to get sick without asking her permission. Uh, but there, I shouldn't talk so. Rachel has been a good wife to him. He'd never have anointed to anything without her, that's for certain. He was born to be ruled, and it's well he fell into the hands of a clever, capable manager like Rachel. He didn't mind her anyway. It saved him the bother of ever making up his own mind about anything. Davy, do stop squirming like an eel. I've got nothing else to do protested Davy. I can't eat any more, and it's no fun watching you and Anne eat. Well, you and Dora go out and give the hens their wheat, said Marilla, and don't you try to pull any more feathers out of the white rooster's tail, either. I wanted some feathers for an engine headdress, said Davy sulkily. Milty Bolter has a dandy one made out of the feathers his mother gave him when she killed their old white Gobbler, you might let me have some. That rooster's got ever so many more than he wants. You may have the old feather duster in the garret, said Anne, and I'll dye them green and yellow and red for you. You do spoil that boy dreadfully, said Marilla, when Davy, with a radiant face, had followed Prim Dora out. Marilla's education had made great strides in the past six years, but she had not been able to rid herself of the idea that it was very bad for a child to have too many of its wishes indulged. All the boys of his class have Indian headdresses, and Davy wants one too, said Anne. I know how it feels. I'll never forget how I used to long for puffed sleeves when all the other girls had them. And Davy isn't being spoiled. He is improving every day. Think what a difference there is in him since he came here a year ago. He certainly doesn't get into as much mischief since he began to go to school, acknowledged Marilla. I suppose he works off the tendency with the other boys. But it's a wonder to me we haven't heard from Richard Keith before this. Never a word since last May. I'll be afraid to hear from him, sighed Anne, beginning to clear away the dishes. If a letter should come, I'd dread opening it, for fear it would tell us to send the twins to him. A month later, a letter did come, but it was not from Richard Keith. A friend of his wrote to say that Richard Keith had died of consumption a fortnight previously. The writer of the letter was the executor of his will, and by that will the sum of two thousand dollars was left to Miss Marilla Cuthbert in trust for David and Dora Keith until they came of age or married. In the meantime, the interest was to be used for their maintenance. It seems dreadful to be glad of anything in connection with in death, said Anne soberly. I'm sorry for poor Mr. Keith, but I am glad that we can keep the twins 
It's a very good thing about the money, said Marilla practically. I wanted to keep them, but I really didn't see how I could afford to do it, especially when they grew older. The rent of the farm doesn't do any more than keep the house, and I was bound that not a cent of your money should be spent on them. You do far too much for them as it is. Dora didn't need that new hat you bought her any more than a cat needs two tails. But now the way is made clear, and they are provided for. Davy and Dora were delighted when they heard that they were to live at Green Gables for good. The death of an uncle, whom they had never seen, could not weigh a moment in the balance against that. But Dora had one misgiving. Was Uncle Richard buried? she whispered to Anne. Uh, yes, dear, of course. He, he isn't like Mirabel Cotton's uncle, is he? In a still more agitated whisper. He won't walk about houses after being buried, will he, Anne? <laughs> That's the end of chapter 22. That was a really short chapter. My hair looks silly today. I washed it. And when it's washed and doesn't have any dirt or product in it, it sits super duper flat. Look at that mullet back there. Hey. Oh, well, yay. The twins get to stay. And just like with Anne, as much as Marilla says, oh, what a hassle. What am I going to do? Oh, they drive me crazy. I think a lot of parents can relate. Um, it would have broken her heart if she had lost those twins. She loves them. And... How funny. How so funny. But so sad about their uncle. But they're so happy they get to stay with Anne. Oh, how sweet. The next chapter, chapter 23, is called Miss Lavender's Romance. So we get to learn more about Miss Lavender and the romance that she had, I would assume, with uh, Paul Irving's father before he married my sweet mother. My sweet little mother, as he calls him. Oh, well, I will see you for chapter 23, hopefully tomorrow. Um, just as a reminder, there are only 30 chapters in all of Anne of Avonlea. 30 chapters, and we're on chapter 23. Only seven more chapters to go. And then what starts next, I'm not even giving you a poll or option. We start the great Gatsby. One of the main reasons why I'm choosing The Great Gatsby is not only because it's a great piece of literature, but because it is brand new to the public domain as of this year. So if you're confused as to what that's all about, I only read books that have been released into the public domain. That means that their copyright is no longer valid after I think it's like a hundred years with a five year something or other depending on where it was published or how it was published. Um, so that means for The Great Gatsby and some other musical works like Gershwin, Rhapsody in Blues, are all in the public domain. The reason I choose to do that is because I would need to be a lawyer <laughs> or have a lawyer or have an agent or have um, other means of procuring the copyrights to be able to produce these readings. Um, and I wouldn't be able to do them in the way that I do where it's not the exact word for word. It's the best uh, versions that I can do in that one solid take and I like it being that way and there's such great pieces of of literature so that's why it's super exciting the great Gatsby for the whole world is now in the public domain so you might see a lot of other companies start releasing audiobooks or different versions of um, spin-offs or the great Gatsby someone makes like a sequel of the book obviously not the original author but like they can do what they want with the story and the content now so excited i will see you next time for chapter 23 bye, -bye.